you know, if you guys keep sitting further and further and back, I'm going to just keep moving this for closer and closer to you, and pretty soon you're going to be on the wall, and we're just going to be close. So just, just got to mention that. How's everybody doing? Good. It's been a tough week, hasn't it? Some pretty terrible things happen in our nation during the week, and it's just, um, it's really disheartening. It's really, it just hurts my heart, and I imagine it hurts everybody's heart to just see how much evil is in the world, and, you know, it's just, it's, there's just such a contrast between what the world worships, what the world thinks is good and what our great God thinks is good. And fortunately, we have his book. And I don't know about you, but I've really been studying and enjoying this study through Nehemiah. Um, it's just amazing to me to see what God can do when he moves a man like Nehemiah and a people like the people of Israel as he empowers them and they become devoted to him. It's just amazing to see what can change in this world. And, and it's really my prayer for our society, for this state, for our country, that we become more like these people so that we can be an angel and a change in this world. Because Lord knows we desperately need the Lord. We need, we need God. We need Jesus in our society. We've gone so far off the tracks and it just, it just saddens me. Even, even after the tragedy in Las Vegas, you had people popping up and mouthing off, just trying to be divisive rather than just coming together and trying to heal people. And, and you know, I just get so sad and I just kind of want to run away. I'm like, why, Lord, why? But then I come back. I come back to the Bible and I read about Nehemiah and what the Lord did through a faithful servant. And then I look out at you, and I'm kind of looking at you, my youth, specifically, because you're my encouragement. I look at your faith and how your young energy, and I, I just imagine and can imagine Jesus using one of you to help ignite a revival like, like we read about in these words. A revival that will change the hearts of men and women. Change the course of our country. Instead of following after the path of darkness, make us once again a great nation that, that follows God and, and, and seeks to honor Him. People, a nation that seeks to bring glory to God rather than to themselves. That would just be a wonderful thing. And as I think about this, I find that kind of overwhelming. I imagine you do too, especially if you're one of the youth that I'm pointing at tonight. Because God could be, he could have his hand on one of you. And that's a little bit intimidating to think about that, isn't it? God's in the business of doing wonderful things. We read about it in the book of Nehemiah, how he completely rebuilt a wall in 52 days. And he can do amazing things still today, and he still does. So one of you, one of you could be the next Joseph, or maybe Gideon. Who, me, Lord? Yeah, you. Or Esther. Maybe one of you is the next Spurgeon the next Billy Graham. Billy Gramoly. Over there now, sorry. But God, God can and does use people. But in order, in order for God to be able to use us for his kingdom, we have something to do here. We need to make sure that we are usable, that we're available for him, that we're prepared for him. And even though every good thing comes from the Lord, we talked about that last time, right? Every good thing comes from Him. That means that we have
have to receive those good things, and we have a part in that. It's not just that we're robots and he winds us up with good stuff and he sends us out. No, he fills us up with good stuff, but then we have to go out and do the things. We have to be used by him, be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and go do the things he's called us to do. We need to be committed to serving him to discerning his will, just like Nehemiah did. And how did he do it? Well, we saw it. We saw how important prayer and fasting is for, was for Nehemiah, to be able to discern God's will. You have to be dedicated to him, like the song that Enoch uh, sang tonight. But there's another way that we're able to be used by the Lord. And tonight, we're going to study about something that we're doing right now. And that's how we come to hear the Word of God. Because it's through the hearing of the Word of God that we, we get to communicate with the Lord. And He communicates with us. He makes known what He wants to do with us. So, we know we talk about this. I know that a lot of times people have an answer for, how do I know what God wants me to do? The, word, the answer is, Study His Word. Be in His Word. Well, now, tonight, we're going to talk about what it's like to hear His Word and the things we have to bring to the table as we come to hear to His Word. So, tonight's study is simply titled, It Starts With the Word. And as we study these verses tonight, we're going to cover Nehemiah 1 through 8, 1 through 8. I want you to see these things, these points that we, we see in these scriptures. We'll see that the people came to hear Nehemiah's or God's word, I'm sorry, in unity. They came to hear God's word attentively. They came to hear God's word expectantly. They came to hear God's word submissively. And finally, they came to hear God's word diligently. So tonight's the word, tonight's uh, learning is the lees, except for the unity. Unity Lee. We could do that. Just as a reminder. So, let's stand and we'll read the verses and then we'll pray. Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 8, if you have your Bibles. If you don't, you should, because I could be reading something completely different and you wouldn't know. Nehemiah 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and the women, and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilakai, and Maasiah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malkajah, Hashum, I like this one, Hashbadanah, Hash bananas, I don't know. Zechariah and Meshalem on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amin, Amin, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabethiah, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Pelaiah, and the, Le the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly. And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Father God, we just um, ask you to be with us tonight, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our hearts, to understand your will, Lord, to discern what it is that you seek to teach us through these passages. Lord, that tonight your word would be uh, just taught powerfully, Lord, and that would be 
received gratefully, we would be attentive, we would be enthusiastic, Lord, and we would be submissive to your word so that you can work in us, Lord, to transform us, to be usable tools for you in building your kingdom. All for your sake, Jesus, in your name we pray, amen. Be seated, please. So verse 1, all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses the Lord had commanded Israel. It's an interesting short little verse, and there's three points I'd like you to see with me in this. I find them very interesting. The first point is, is that Nehemiah says that they gathered to hear God's word as echad ish, that's the Hebrew for one, one person, which, which the, the meaning, the definition, the conveyance of that is that the people all gathered together as a same mind with a common purpose. They all gathered as one. And it's interesting. They came in the same mind. So as I'm thinking about this and praying about this, I think about how diverse we are. Well, this church isn't as diverse as some churches, but generally God's church is very diverse. We have people from different backgrounds, all the way from the poorest to the richest. We have people that have been uneducated, all the way to the people that are PhDs and on to things like that. So you have a very diverse group of people. But it's interesting because even though maybe the person that never went to school wouldn't generally consider coming and, and sitting next to somebody with a PhD, they came together. All those differences were sat, set aside. They came in a unity of mind with the expectation of hearing God speak to them. So it's interesting. They put aside personal differences. They might have had feuds with their neighbors. Maybe their neighbor was always leaving their garage door open or their trash can out and that bugged them. But that didn't matter. They came in unity. Maybe, maybe they were... Um, having a, a philosophical dispute with somebody. Maybe one was a Republican and another Democrat, but that didn't matter. They came in unity before God uh, to hear his word. So it's interesting. They joined with this unity of mind, even if they didn't have, here's another thing, the interp same interpretation of what was being taught. And I was th thinking of this, of different denominations. You know, we have so many different denominations in this, in this country and in the world, and sometimes I can't help but think that that doesn't necessarily bring our Lord pleasure because we disagree over little doctrinal things. Yeah, we agree on the important things, but sometimes we let these, these minor things come b between us as Christians. And these people overcame all these things. Um, Remember at this time, this is as Israel's getting back together, and I, I had to think that the beginnings of the seeds of the differences in theologies between the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the scribes, this was all starting to, to, to percolate here. But it didn't matter. They came together as one mind. Here at Grace Avenue, we say that there's one interpretation of the Scripture that's correct, and I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Does that mean that we necessarily have that? I don't know. I know I don't necessarily have it down. I know that I do need to have the essentials down, but I also need know that I need to be humble about some matters. Things like election versus free will pre-tribulation rapture versus post-trib. Is there going to be an actual thousand-year reign? You know what? The Lord's in control, and He knows. He knows the Word and its correct interpretation, and He's the only person that really knows the true, correct interpretation of this absolutely. So as we study things, it's good to, to do a lot of research, read different commentaries, do all these things and get our minds filled with these possibilities that as long as they are based in Scripture, and I mean solidly, solidly in Scripture, I don't mean to just cherry pick something and try to make your own theology out of it, but that something is backed up by Scripture, 
then we need to be hold some things a little bit open-handed as we go there. But as I look at these people, the big thing is, and the thing for us as a family, is for us to come echad ish, of one mind, to hear God's word, because God will speak to us, and that's a neat thing. The next thing I want you to notice in these verses is, I have a question for you. Who asked Ezra the scribe, or Ezra the priest, to come read the scriptures to them? Did you notice that when we read it? Did Nehemiah say, hey, everybody show up this day on the first day of the seventh month and, and, and be in the square before the water gate and I'm going to have Ezra preach to you. Is that what happened? No. The people asked Ezra to come preach. That's interesting, isn't it? And why I started thinking about that. Why did they do that? What led them to it? And I kind of think... A lot of it was just watching Nehemiah and the godly men that he had appointed over them, in addition to all the great works that God had done through them. The people realized there was something different about Nehemiah and the men he, re he uh, appointed over them. What was that difference? Well, it said that they were more godly than others. That Nehemiah, as he looked at him, he was always praying and seeking God's will, and he seemed to hear God's will, and how was he able to do that? Well, he probably knew God's word very well. So the people wanted to be more like their leaders, and they invited um, Ezra to come preach to them out of the word. The author of Hebrews tells us to remember your re leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And I think this is exactly what we're seeing here. They're seeing their leaders and they're going, wow, we want to be like them. How do we do that? We need to know the word. Nehemiah knows the word. So they dump it, jump into it. And finally, this is kind of a, min a minor detail, but I think it's worth noting. It's, it's, you know, there's, God doesn't put anything in his word. Just there, there are no throwaway verses in the Bible. Okay? There's not something that the, uh, the, the author said, oh, I'm going to write this in here just, just to, to, to make my word count. If you're a student, you know you've had professors that wanted 5,000 word essays, and I know you've kind of said things the same way, three different ways to make that word count. Well, the Bible's not like that. Okay, God puts every word in here for a reason. And he says, they gathered in front of the water gate. Now, what's interesting about that is if you remember, where did they start rebuilding the wall? Do you guys remember? Remember what gate that was in front of? It was in front of the sheep gate, remember? And who is the sheep gate? Jesus Christ, right? Jesus says, I am the shepherd. My people hear my voice and they come through that and he is the gate. Well, what does Jesus do once he saves us? He washes us in water. He, he has us be born anew. And it's interesting. I think there's a, a kind of a rich symbolism there. And it's just an interesting little point as we look at that. So I think that's, that's kind of a fun little detail. So, they all came to hear God's word in unity. Next point is they came to hear God's word attentively. Verse 2. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. I think the main takeaway on this is from these verses is the fact that the people came out, as, as Nehemiah himself says, attentively. And we're going to cover that. But there's some other points here that I think are interesting that we need to look at first. Now, whenever we read the Bible, it's important for us to read and figure out and discern the difference between what's descriptive and what's prescriptive in the Bible. 
What do I mean by that? Well, some things are descriptive. They just give a historical account of things the way they were. So some of, some of the things that the Bible describes, they, they're just descriptive. The cultures at this time did this and stuff like that. But other things are prescriptive. In other words, it's put in there because God expects us to act or behave in certain ways and to do certain things. Now, I bring this up to you because... There's some interesting things in here. It says, in verse 2, it says, Ezra the priest brought the law before the whole assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. Now, the thing that's interesting to me in that is, well, we know who the men and the women were. Now, who are these all that could understand what was heard? I think it was the children. So, this is kind of interesting because children are able to understand the gospel. How many of you have taught in Sunday schools? I know more of you than that have. But are, are children able to understand the gospel from a pretty young age? Yeah, sure. The gospel's interesting. The word of God is powerful. So then, as, as you look at this, who were these children then? What, were, what, what ages were they? Were they 16 and under? Because at 16 in the Jewish, that was the transition between being a child and adult. So were, were they at least 16 years old? Were they 14? Were they 10? It doesn't say, does it? It just says all that could understand. But it does speak to something that's kind of contrary to, to the way many, many American churches are run. Because in a lot of churches here in the, in the United States, people come to church, and they bring their children with them. They have a whole boatload of children, and then what do they do? They take their children back to children's ministry, and they, they drop them off. And they, you know, at Crossroads Church, where Jan and I go the other times, they have ministry all the way from nursery all the way up through high school. So you take people and drop them in these age little age segregated rooms and they have specific teachings for them, which is great. People pour into them. But here's the bad thing. If the people are coming with a unity of mind, how, how are the younger people able to have a unity of mind when they're, for all intents and purposes, going to a totally separate church? If all the youths are separated out, how are they going to come to a unity of mind with all the rest of God's people? It's an interesting question. Is that descriptive or prescriptive? I don't know. So who were these children? Who could understand? I imagine each parent was responsible for deciding whether or not their child would be able to understand the word. But again, unity there. So it's interesting. The next thing I want you to see is the amount of time they spent hearing the word. It says, Ezra read from early morning. So I kind of looked up this word, and I was looking in it in Hebrew. And uh, it just kind of dawned on me as I was kind of playing around with this early morning. Hmm. This is a primarily agrarian society, right? So most people are farmers. Well, personally, I've never had the pleasure of living on the farm. I don't know if some of you may have before. But I know that on most farms, the work starts very early in the morning. Early morning. So I started looking at, at this up. And I said, on this date, on the first day, first day of the month and the seventh month and all that, in Israel... Sunrise would have been at 6.15 in the morning. Now, the word for early morning, ord, in, in the Hebrew, actually means daybreak or dawn of light. So probably from, at least from 6.15 in the morning till about noontime, they're sitting there listening to Ezra read from the book of the law. Huh? Six hours. Man, and Jan and I think your services here are long. <laughs> Six hours in the sun. Oh, okay. 
That's a, that's a long time. But here's the amazing part. And this is the main part here. Because it says, the ears of all the people were attentive to the book, to the, uh, book of the law. Now, I'm not going to pick on anybody tonight. I'm not going to pick on anybody. But in as, fatter, as a matter of fact, I'm thankful and praise God that you people have come back to church for a second time in the same day and you're all here. But the reality of it is that some of you are not really being attentive to God's word tonight. And I'm not accusing you because I've been there myself. Okay? I know what it's like to come in and the preacher's kind of droning on and you know, what is he talking about? And then you think, oh, I need to do this when I get home. And the next thing you know, you're 40 miles away daydreaming about something. Or even worse, I'm not seeing it tonight, thank you. But, you know, some of you have had really nice dreams while, while we've been in, in church. I've, I've seen it. I've witnessed it, okay? So it's hard to be attentive. Although sometimes I've done this. I'll, I'll, I'll confess that I've actually been dreaming that I was listening to the sermon. So hopefully you're at least doing that. But, you know, but it says they were attentive. Six hours in the sun. All who could understand. That means the little fidgety ones are even being attentive. That's amazing, guys. What was, what was Ezra reading from? Well, it says the book of the law, so it's probably Levit Leviticus or Deuteronomy, but could you imagine if he was reading from Numbers for six hours? I don't know. That would be pretty tough. But they listened attentively. They were paying close attention to what was being read. Why? Why? Why were they being so attentive? Because they realized that they were hearing the word of God. You know what? We're spoiled. Most of us have one of these. Or, or one of these. Okay whatever it's on. But we have access to God's word. In this time, in this day and age, there wasn't a Bible in every home. The very rich may have had some scrolls transcribed, but they weren't, they weren't commonplace. So in order to hear the word, you had to go hear the word. You had to listen to someone like Ezra read the word. So it wasn't, they weren't spoiled like we were. They, they were paying attention because, wow, this is God's word and maybe, maybe God has something to say to me. So they threw out all their preoccupations. They didn't care about what was going on in their homes because they came to listen attentively. And I have to ask us, because I, I, again, I'm, I'm preaching to myself also here. Do we come to church with this same attitude? Do we come attentively? Do we expect to hear God speak into us through his word being taught? I, don't, I have to admit, I don't always do it. I don't, but that's not a good thing. We need to be able to come attentively and expect that God is going to speak to us. And that brings us to our next point. Because a byproduct of being attentive is being expectant. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and he opened it, and all the people stood. Now what does that got to do with being expectant? Well, it's another one of those points that I think might be a little bit convicting for us at times because it talks about our heart, how we come before God. When we read in verse 5 that, and it doesn't say that Ezra commanded the people to stand. It says that he opened the book and the people stood. And it was interesting. Why? Why did they stand? You know, a couple months ago I had jury duty. And as you're sitting in the courtroom, every time the judge comes in and out, the bailiff will stand up and say, all rise. And you all have to stand up for the, for the judge as they come in. 
and, and all that. Why? Why do we do that? Is it because the judge is really a special person? No, but the office of the judgeship is. And so it's a, it's a matter of respect and showing deference to that office. The same way, even, even if, let's say this was three years ago, President Obama walked through the doors, I would hope that we would still all stand out of respect for the office of the president, or maybe even the governor. What's his name? Never mind. But, you know, we, we do these things out of respect. Well, what we're reading about here goes much, much deeper than having respect. Because what we're reading about is craving a relationship. Being expectant that you're going to receive something from the Lord when you hear His Word. I was thinking about this. Here's the analogy I thought of. Let's say you had a really, really good friend, or not so much a good friend, but a good acquaintance that you really admired. And they had been gone for a couple of months traveling the world. And you hadn't really been able to keep in touch with them while they were traveling because you don't know them that well, but you know them and you respect them. And so you're at a gathering, say something like this, and they walk in the door. How would you react to that? Most of us would kind of get up and we go, oh, hey, it's Bob or Mikhail or whoever, Vlad. And how are your travels? And you would expectantly go up there and re-engage them and expect to receive information from them, a relationship. This is kind of the picture that we have here. As these people are seeing God's word, they're standing up and they're expecting to get this relationship, expecting to receive from the Lord. They're eager to connect with God. And it's interesting as you think about it. Because who were these people? Who were these people? Remember, these are the children of the exiles. These are the children that mess this up, of the people that mess this up. These are the children of the people that didn't care about God's word. These people had just, eh, God, big deal. What's he done for us lately? So what did God do? Hey, Babylon. See you later. Go into exile. You don't care about my word? Okay. But God has brought them home, and they realize this. And they see the miracle of the wall being rebuilt, and they're going, God's hand is in this. And now they have God's word coming out, and we want to know you, Lord. We want to, we want to receive from you. So it's this desire that we're seeing here. What about us? What about you? What about me? Do we bring this when we come to church? Do we bring this expectancy that God is going to touch us through his word? I don't always do it. Why do you come to church? Because your neighbor sees you and you look good when you come to church? I hope not. You come to church because your parents tell you you better go to church or I'm taking your car away? I hope that's not why you come to church. Do you come to church just for the relationship and to listen to the music? It's a better reason to, but I hope that's not the only reason. I hope and I pray that the reason we come to church is that we expectantly receive to hear from God and we expect His Word to transform us and to reshape us into His people. Which brings us to our next point. They came to hear God's word submissively. And Ezra, verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And again, we're seeing an outward, a physical manifestation of the attitude that we need to bring with us as we come to hear God's word. It's interesting because our physical demeanor, how we act, actually affects how we're able to receive the word. They came attentively, they came expectantly, and they came submissively so they could be transformed by the word. 
So when Ezra blessed the Lord, they all answered, Amen, Amen. Now, I find this interesting because I know that in Russian, Amen is Amin. Well, I looked up the Hebrew for Amen, and do you know what it is? It's Amen. So it's kind of interesting that God has kept this word. Jan asked me, so what is it in the Greek? I didn't look it up in the Greek, but I kind of suspect it might be similar. It's just interesting that God uses this. Guess what we say in, in, when we go to India? Amen. So it's, it's kind of interesting. More important than just the fact that the word amen seems to be universal is what amen means. And what it means is truth, so be it. Truth, so be it. So we hear, we praise God, and we expect to hear his word. And what, what's our response? Truth, and let it be. So it's interesting. They were reminded that what God was saying is God supreme, and what he says is truth. Now I want you to notice a couple more things here. It says, they lifted up their hands. They lifted up their hands. I have a question for you. Is this descriptive or prescriptive? They lifted up their hands. In other words, was this just a cultural thing? Or is this something that God expects of us? I'm going to go out on a limb here. Personally, I think it's prescriptive, and I'll tell you why. I'll give you an example. We're talking about having a submissive attitude and demeanor before our Lord, right? Well, in the military, you guys know I was in the military, and I was an officer in the military. In the military, if I were walking down the street and there were an enlisted man coming the other way, it was required of the enlisted man to salute me and hold his salute until I saluted him and then he could, could drop his salute. Why? Why is that? Because it's a physical reminder telling that person that they are in submission to the authority over them. It's not just a, how are you, sir? It's, it's a physical manifestation. And it's interesting, but we have these things that, that remind us of, of our submissiveness. Just like having to stand for the judge. I could, have, I could realize in my mind that the judge is superior to me, but the fact that I had to stand for the judge reinforces that. So, again... Is this descriptive or prescriptive? I'll leave that up to you in your prayer time with the Lord. But here's another thing we can take before the Lord in prayer also. Because it says, They bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Is this descriptive or prescriptive? I don't know again. But what I do know what I do know from my own personal experience of the times in my life when I have felt the most rebellious, when I didn't want to pray, and when I, when I did pray, I didn't want to listen to the Lord, that when I got down on my hands and knees and I bowed down to my God and I said, Lord, I'm a wicked man. Lord, change me. Lord, meet me. Lord, tell me what I need to know. That there was a change in my heart. That I was able to receive what the Lord wanted to have me know. So there is something to this. Again, is it descriptive or prescriptive? I don't know. If it's prescriptive, we're going to have to rearrange all the seats so we can all get on our faces before the Lord. And we'd have to clean the carpets. But that's a different thing. That's not up to me. But again, take that before the Lord in your prayer time. And I'll tell you what, if you've never been on your face before the Lord, the next time you're struggling with something, try it. It's incredibly freeing. And it, it's, it's just the Lord meets you there. So it's interesting. The big part in this, in being submissive, is it tells us that 
The people came to hear God's word with their hearts prepared to hear and receive God's word. Now here's an interesting thing I was, as I was preparing for this. It's like, if we come to church, men, I know you've, you've done this. I know, I know every man has dealt with this. Now in my family, it's a little bit reversed because my wife's the person that's like time fixated. Okay, my whole career, especially when I was an airline pilot, I had to live by the schedule. So when I'm home, I really try not to live by the schedule. I, I, I don't like to be late, but I, I, don't, I don't set in my mind, okay, at 7.05, we have to be in the car and going somewhere. But I know some of you are like that. And I know that can lead to a little bit of friction. And so what happens is you're trying to, trying to get your family in the car and you're going, why isn't anybody ready? We go to church every Sunday morning and we leave at this time. Why, why do I have to round everybody up and get them out in the car? And so you start getting a little bit huffy and then what happens in the car is people start getting a little bit bickery, right? And they're like, blah, 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 blah. a little bit back and forth. Has anybody been there? Happens with the kids too, doesn't it? Dad's going, well, oh. we get to church, and what happens? Are our hearts prepared to hear God's word? No, because we're sitting there fuming, aren't we? Why is my dad so unreasonable? Why is my husband such a jerk? Why can't my family ever get to ready on time? And you know what happens as you're doing there? Is it you end up having these marvelous arguments in your head. In Ephesians, Paul tells us, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And I think it's situations like this that he's talking about in large part where we have these little minor disputes. And then I know I've sat in church right next to my wife and I've had a huge argument with her. And she never spoke never said a word. But I'm imagining, well, if I say this, she'll say that. Next thing I know, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm angry at her. I'm like, Argh. oh, is the sermon over? What, we're standing up to, to sing again? What, what happened? Did, did, did the pastor preach? Your heart's not ready to receive God's word. It's one of those examples, right? So if those things happen, we need to make sure, as Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let these things fester. If you have a dispute with your family on the way to church, stop in the parking lot and pray together and work it out so that when we come before God, we can receive his word in all submission. If we don't resolve these conflicts, they consume us. They just take over in our minds. And little minor things turn into big, big giant things. And here's the ironic part is half the time the person next to you is going, what in the world are you angry about? I don't have a clue what it is you're talking about. But we can do this. Don't let the sun set on your sin. Get prepared. Bring a submissive heart to hear God's word so that you can be like these people we read about who came to hear God's word diligently. Verse 7. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shab Shabethai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josadab, Hanan, Paliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book of the law of God clearly and they gave sense so that the people understood the readings. Two things here. This is interesting. So the Levites were there. They were ready to help the people understood what they had heard. So I imagine they probably heard Ezra preaching till about noon and then maybe took a, a little, little lunch and then they did what, what we would call Bible studies. The Levites went out with them. 
home groups, however you want to do this. Is this descriptive or prescriptive? Again, this is another one of those things that I think is prescriptive, that we need to be in small groups so we can discuss what was said, so we can rightly understand God's Word. It's just an interesting thing. It's one of those things we shouldn't neglect. Now, I use the word diligently here. Why did I use diligently? Well, I kind of using it synonymously with being teachable. But the word diligent has an interesting definition. It means showing care and conscientiousness in one's works or duties. How does that apply here? What work is there here? Well, the work is to receive God's word, to learn from it, to be transformed by it. So you need to apply ourselves, we need to apply ourselves diligently to that task. We need to be able to be applied to it. It carries with it this idea that you take delight in this duty. These people came expectantly, attentively. So they're taking delightfully God's word, knowing that it's going to transform them. So they were very teachable. It shows us that they came to hear God's word and they expected to be taught by God. I do apologize for this, but since a lot of you don't have your Bibles, I put it up there. This is out of um, um, Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 16, if you have it. God gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's you guys. You're the saints. The work of the teacher is to equip you for the works of the ministry. For building up the body of Christ. So that we have more, more brothers and sisters in with us. For building it up. Until we all attain the unity of faith. Huh, there's that word again. Unity. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. We know who Jesus is to mature manhood or womanhood, to become mature, to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, in other words, be transformed as much as we can into the image of Christ, so that may, we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, this is the work of the ministry, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is to he the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, those verses are a whole nother sermon, or a few sermons. But that's, that's our purpose here. And how do we get there? By coming in the way we need to, to be equipped by God, by coming in unity, by coming expectantly, submissively, expecting to be taught by the Word. God's Word is clear enough for a child to receive the Gospel. We talked about that. Yet it's also deep enough that some of the brightest minds in human history have dedicated their entire lives to studying the Scriptures. Their entire lives. And we can learn from those people. We can learn from those people so that we become mature believers, so that we can grow his church, build the body up in love. God equips his, his shepherds and his teachers so that the saints can be built up for the work of his ministry. By the way, I know this question has come up before, is how do you deal with someone that says, well, I don't like organized religion. I don't, I don't believe in going to church. I just read the Bible on my own. You know, this, this passage here is an argument against that. First of all, why? Well, first off, you can't have a unity with the body of church if you're sitting home alone or with just your family. There's no unity in that. So there's the first fallacy of what they're saying. You have to be in a, in a body to have unity. And secondly, 
God probably hasn't really equipped that person as a shepherd or as a teacher. Well, why do I say that? Because out of personal experience, and I know Pastor Vlad and Pastor Michael and all the other elders here can tell you that when God gives you this gift and tells you that you're to teach his word, it's got to come out somehow. And you can't be a teacher if there's no one there to teach. So again, it's one of those interesting points against people being by themselves and isolated. We can't ignore the gathering of the saints. We have to be a part of this body. And when we come to hear God's word, if we're going to build a faith that endures, like we saw Nehemiah and the people do, I'm going to say it again. We need to come in unity, attentively, expectantly, submissively, and listen to the word diligently so that God can teach us and build us up through his word. Amen? I'd like to invite the worship team up. Let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Jesus, you are wonderful to us. You, you are just so amazing. You, you came to earth to call us out of the darkness, Lord God, and you give us Holy Spirit to live within us, Lord, to, to let us know and to, and to hear from you, Lord, to help us to discern your word and to, to put it into action, Lord God. You've just equipped us so wonderfully, Lord. And Lord, I pray for all of us, Lord, that we would, we would have our hearts in the right places, Lord, that our minds would be aligned with you, Lord, that we would come in unity before you expectantly, submissively, expecting to hear from you, Lord, for you to transform us from the inside out. Lord, we thank you for this example of the people in, that we read of here in Nehemiah. And Lord, I just uh, thank you for this book and how we're going to see the transformative effect that your word has on these people, Lord. And we pray that you do the same work of transformation in each and every one of us. Lord, that you would be the king and ruler of our hearts. That you would be our all in all, Jesus. So, Lord, I just lift these people up to you, Lord. Every one of us, Lord God, I lift this all up to you, that you would just be with us this week. Lord, that you would be constantly present with us. That, not that you're not there, Lord, but that we would be constantly aware of you and that we would have a hunger and thirst to hear from you, Lord, through your word, through prayer, through fasting. Lord, draw us nearer to you. We want to be your good kids. We want to be your ambassadors to a world that needs you so desperately, Lord. Lord, I just pray that one of these here tonight, Lord, would be the person, the next Nehemiah, Lord, a person that would transform our culture and our society, Lord. We're here for you, Jesus. Please use us. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen.